Executive Coordinator and a member of the Student Advisory Board at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program. Discussion groups are made possible by Newman's Own Foundation. This spring series is presented in partnership with the Kosovo American Education Fund. Dr. Gashi's residency is made possible with support of the Yema Opportunity Fund. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel. You can also access past videos of past Dole Institute programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. That's dolequestions at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind and ask again just one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> and before we hand things over to Dr. Gashi, here's a special video from an alum of the Kosovo American Education Fund. Hello, my name is Irla Jikove, and I'm very excited to share with you my experience as a student in the US. I've had the opportunity to study in the US twice, once as an exchange student with the Kennedy Luger YES program, and later on as a master's fellow with KF. During my time in the US, I've earned a master's degree in accounting analytics and a graduate certification in business analytics. These experiences have given me a better understanding of how important data-driven decision-making is and the skill set necessary to apply it. Now, as a member of one of the leading tech companies in Kosovo, I get to apply that skill set every day in making informed decisions about the company. These educational experiences have been instrumental in my success and I'm grateful for the opportunity to, ha to have learned from some of the best minds in the field. My time in the US was not only about the academics though, it was also a time of personal growth as I learned to navigate through new relationships, a new culture, and challenging myself in a way that I never had before. These experiences helped me become more independent, more adaptable, and more confident in myself. Thank you to the Dole Institute for this opportunity to share my story. It's a privilege and an honor to talk to an institution bearing the name of such a distinguished figure to our people and to our country. I do hope that this little video of mine inspires others to pursue their dreams and take advantage of the opportunities that education can provide. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for this third and final session of uh, our discussion series, uh, Building Democracy in the 21st Century, focusing on Kosovo. Uh, today, we are going to examine the question, is a sound legal system sufficient? And uh, we will look at Kosovo and the Balkan region one year after the start of the uh, aggression against Ukraine. I would like to introduce uh, today's guest, Dr. Enver Hassani, who was the first president of the Constitutional Court of the Republic of Kosovo between 2009 and 2015. He was a member of the Venice Commission, indeed the first representative of Kosovo. He is currently a professor of international law and international relations at the University of Pristina, where he previously served as its rector or president or chancellor, depending on where you are. From 1992 to 1997, Dr. Hassani was a legal advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Albania. He participated in the Rambouillet Conference on Kosovo in 1999 as part of the Kosovo delegation. Uh, he has published four books and numerous academic articles regarding different aspects of civil law, constitutional law, public international law and international relations, and has given talks at many universities. He was also a Fulbright Scholar at Northwestern University, and he has studied at the University of Pristina, uh, civil and economic law, at Bilkent University, an MA and PhD in international law and relations, and uh, Dr. Hassani also holds the title of Doctor Honoris Causa from University Coceli. 
Dr. Hassani, it's a pleasure, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, <coughs> Chandrim. It's my pleasure to be with you in this nice audience in this um, uh, wonderful uh, institute, as was put by a former student, U.S. student, of, uh, who bears the names, name of a friend of Kosovo and the region, I would say, Robert Dole, who was the first uh, friend that they had these days for, for Kosovo and its population during Milosevic's time, dictatorship, as we all know, is very fierce, uh, like every uh, dictatorship. So it's my pleasure to be with you, and I look forward to our conversation on Thank the you. issue of democracy, both in Kosovo and outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, perhaps <coughs> since our audience is supposed to be um, you know, less acquainted, uh, and, and the idea is to, for us to, to share our experience and, and viewpoints with them, uh, with Kosovo's democracy, I would like to start uh, with a question regarding Kosovo's democracy and constitution as compared to other countries in the Balkan region, but also in the world. How would you characterize Kosovo's uh, democracy and constitution? Right. Uh, Kosovo uh, democracy is, um, um, in fact, would fall within the uh, uh, space of former communist democracies, which are, as we all know, constitutional democracies with, of course, certain specificities which you would not find elsewhere, neither in the region of the Balkans, nor, for example, beyond it, like in Czech, Slovak Republic of Romania. And this is due to the fact that Kosovo was established as a state with the strong support of uh, our friends, American friends and European friends, who uh, had an understanding for our suffering and uh, the um, attempted genocide that uh, was taking place during 1998-99 and was stopped by, uh, uh, by uh, NATO, uh, that stopped the Milosevic machinery. And then we had an international administration which uh, uh, offered uh, very specific legal infrastructure which you, again, would not find, in fact, not only in the region, but wider in the world because uh, UN mission or UN administration that was installed in Kosovo in 1999 was the largest ever mission, which uh, had components both of uh, state building, society building, and uh, democracy developing, I would say, in a larger, in a larger sense, in, in, in addition to economic reconstruction at the basic um, uh, level. So, Yes, we are uh, uh, constitutional democracy. Then we have uh, that type of democracy or political regime is based on um, uh, what, what is called, and it's very rare found in the world, is, is called consociational democracy. You, find, you will find now in Lebanon, part uh, in Belgium, for example, in Cyprus, which is uh, invention, theoretical invention, uh, by a Dutch author, Arend Lippjard, who uh, uh, spoke and wrote about it uh, almost uh, 70 years ago, and then it was uh, implemented with pretty success in several countries, as I said, I mentioned just few. Uh, not, to ma not to forget here, Bosnia Herzegovina as well, which is, but with, uh, with again, certain specificities, specificities, but conceptually the same, the same one as uh, the democracy nourished uh, in Kosovo. What is the basic feature of this democracy is that for those who are not familiar with the region, you know, the history has shown both uh, bad and wrong uh, cases of uh, copying other political systems. Uh, Kosovo constitutional political system doesn't match what is called material structure, meaning culture of the local population. If you read our constitution, our laws, not only now as independent countries since 2008, but even before that, or to be more precise, since the Rambouillet Peace Accords, you would find a continuation of, of the same legal 
technique and logic. Uh, setting up institutions, categories uh, uh, that do not match culture, political and social culture of general population living in Kosovo, no matter the ethnicity, because neither Serbs nor Albanians nor, nor other communities had any tradition in democracy as the whole region of the Balkans, okay? But then this, this implies, this takes time for those norms to be acquainted with, with the population and the people learn how to behave according to them. This is, uh, uh, as uh, Ruti Titel, it's uh, a famous American uh, scholar on, uh, on, uh, on um, uh, transition justice, transitional justice, says about schizophrenic role of the law. The law is a pro product of uh, war and conflict. At the same time, it aims to overcome that conflict uh, mentality uh, of, of the society on which it is, uh, it is applied. So Kosovo is a typical example of that type of uh, uh, democracy. This is a, is a good example alongside, I would say, for example, Japan and Germany, for example, that matter with which you are familiar with. For example, constitution very often of Japan is called McCartney constitution, or German's basic law was done in a very, I would say, dramatic conditions for the German nations following the, uh, uh, following the defeat of the Nazi government. Because uh, that those years, for example, you would imagine those societies, both Japan and Germany, and to the, for that matter, Italy in 48, had traumas of the war and it, you know, democracy, rule of law. These things were alien for those nations. They had no tradition. Germany was the only one that had tradition during the Weimar Republic, which was killed by Hitler in 1933. So, and it's small, 15 years, let's say. Then the constitutions of these countries now serve as an example for, for us, for example, for Kosovo, Germany, and Italy, since they, are, they have what we say constitutional justice, which, whose president I was, is separate, it's not like in the states where you have Supreme Courts and other courts doing constitutional justice as well. No, in, in Kosovo, this is European model, which, which is Germany is the, I would say, founding Austria and Germany, are, or German-speaking nations, uh, founding fathers of that type of justice, whereby you have constitutional courts being separated from the regular judiciary, and they deal only constitutional issues. No, no regular stuff uh, of case and controversy as it is in your country. Then this, for example, if you see that Italy belongs to that as well, we have such a, uh, we have such a uh, mechanism, constitutional mechanism, which has been almost a you know, decade and a half now in place, which uh, I would say after 10 years, there would be one full generation who is brought up with this legal infrastructure, learning with these laws, with these constitutions. You know, uh, uh, the patterns of behavior has gradually changed. And this is shown, I, I can say this from my first-hand experience at the beginning, because it was new. And people would start interpreting based with the old logic of legal theory of communist times, because Kosovo had constitutional justice as formerly, uh, part of former Yugoslavia. But that was utterly different. Apart from name, everything was different. So then uh, uh, that created initially conceptual misunderstandings. Now in this sense, I would say Kosovo is, uh, is unique in the region uh, because our constitutional democracy has uh, that type of democracy, which is called, as I said, consociational democracy, in which existing social, religious, linguistic, regional, and other cleavages are further, further uh, 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 partialized so that every single interest of certain community up to the individuals is reflected in every single legal norm and practices based on it. And so this, in this sense, Kosovo 
uh, you know, uh, the whole system, uh, office of the president, head of state, uh, prime minister, court system, local self-government, ev everything you find this reflected in, you know, uh, with all communities being represented from our, starting from our flag at the end of the day. Um, so that, uh, so that, uh, uh, b and why this is so? Because, uh, because uh, the region, as I said, had uh, uh, utterly violent past. You know, uh, 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 Europe, unfortunately, uh, for uh, the, our neighbors, uh, our, or our neighborhood, uh, uh, was um, uh, first genocide in Europe following the second Holocaust uh, tragedy. So uh, Kosovo went to war with uh, Serbia, attacked Croatia, Bosnia, one by one. Then it ended up in, in Kosovo. So why, why, for example, in Kosovo constitution and in some constitutions uh, of neighboring Kosovo, you find uh, constitutional expression communities, ethnic communities, ethnic and other communities. You don't find national minorities uh, stuff. Because in the Balkans, uh, once you are defined in the past, this, is, this belongs, hopefully we all, we, we tend to believe that this is the past. Uh, uh, once you were defined as minority, by default, you would have lesser rights, you know? So that's why they invented a first text this was repeated in Kosovo, uh, Northern Macedonia afterwards. The first text that mentions this uh, language and this philosophy, legal philosophy and practice, was Rambuya courts, in which you will find the communities of Kosovo, all. Meaning that we are majority community, for example, because Kosovo-wide, we are majority. But in some parts of Kosovo, we, we are minority. We meaning, we meaning the ethnic Albanian. Ethnic, ethnic Albanians, yeah. of course. When we say uh, ethnic Albanians were a majority in most of the territory. But in certain par parts of Kosovo, we are minority community. Meaning that uh, uh, definition is uh, value free, in a sense. I would say it's value free. Meaning that it doesn't tend to be biased towards any of the communities. And this is, as I said, reflected in laws and bylaws in every tiny legal infrastructure that is built in Kosovo. This, and I have to mention this, uh, would not have been done, of course, without uh, international help. First and foremost, Americans, then Europeans, who invest huge amounts of, uh, I would say, only God knows, billions of your taxes to build our justice system. In my time, for example, and we used to have three international judges. One of them was American from Minnesota, one from Portugal, one from Bulgaria. Okay, one was former communist country, West, far, I would say far West, and then again, Portugal is again Europe's, Europe's Cabo da Roca is the most uh, Western point of Europe in Portugal. So then that experience and that um, exchange of practices and views you know, uh, and was extremely helpful for the, that generation to build an institutional memory where still today you would see those who are familiar with decisions of the court, they see the same logic being traced back uh, uh, to the founding years of our highest, uh, uh, highest uh, justice court. Yes. Because that, that judicial, Stop it's, it's justice part, meaning because it controls or it reviews constitutionality or it controls behavior of every political body within, within the country. Yes, so, so we have, you know, we have a professor yeah. ahead of us, this so of course of he's, uh, <laughs> he's going to, uh, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you because I have a Please. few, few uh, questions. Um, so you mentioned a little bit your experience and I would like to know, how was it being uh, the president of the Constitutional Court of a, of a new country? And, uh, and also, um, I, I, I know for sure as, a, as, a, as an active citizen that you know, there were cases that were more controversial. 
Uh, and then there are probably cases that were not very much known to the public. And what are you most proud of? What is a case that you know the, the public in Kosovo didn't really talk about, but you thought, there you go, I've made my, my, my mark. Right. So if you could tell us a little bit about, about right. your personal experience, please. Right. Uh, look, constitutional interpretation in your country and every, everywhere is always, uh, you know, potentially controversial because constitutional norms are the most abstract human products written in a text. So you have, once you interpret that in a concrete real case of controversy, of course you would not please everyone. That's why somebody would. Important thing is that it holds. It holds for, for, for generations and generations and it builds a certain, or it frames behavior as it does in every constitutional interpretation. I would, uh, for example, there are of course scores of them, but uh, for citizens wide of importance, we ruled, for example, several cases I would mention briefly, which is, which is called the right to life, the Anacastrati case. We say, as you, uh, you know, by name of the uh, victim, she, she was uh, killed by her former husband and uh, uh, state didn't provide for uh, her security because once divorced, like in your culture, because of the same lay laws, Western, Western models uh, legislation, in divorce, you, if one of the partners is violent, then the state has to interfere and give some limitations to the freedom of the husband, mostly husband, because uh, this is how it goes uh, with violence. Uh, in a certain area, in certain, you know, and of course, state has to enforce that order, which it did not, and she was tragically killed, and uh, the case ended up before constitutional court, and we ruled that the state failed to provide for the right to life, which is constitutional right, and in our constitution, there is no death penalty. It's European standard. Uh, uh, you know, apart from Belarus, I, I don't know. What's, what is the maximum is, penalty? Uh, what is the maximum penalty? Uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, 40 years, I guess, 40 years. Because I'm not a criminal lawyer that much proficient, but uh, that's it. And uh, that was, and she, of course, her, her family received redress. Uh, her parents and, 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 uh, and, uh, and kids. On another issue, uh, which I would single out, uh, uh, that I feel uh, proud that I was part of it, was uh, what we say with, this, with one of the commercial banks in Kosovo. Uh, uh, it was a wide practice then. In interest rates in every country here as well, in every Western society, there is a standard of the, of the level of the interest rates and whether you can put interest rates on interest rates, you know, and that's not allowed anywhere, okay? So people were in delay paying the original debt, citizens, then following that, some local lawyers who were coqueteering with banks and serving, because uh, our legal system is not, it's fragile, okay? You would find lawyers uh, doing the, mediating between uh, you know, judges, prosecutors, banks, and clients, in a, in a, which is here illegal, you know, the way they do it. And then they, uh, 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 one of that kind of my former student would approach me in the office, not the office, or in the coffee bar where I used to have coffee in the morning, and saying, look, uh, you have a case, this can I see you know, to help us, and I said, what's the case about? Because when you are chief justice and you're a manager of a certain institution, you don't look for the micromanagement. You know, there are people who do it, who are in charge, who are paid for it, judges and other colleagues. colleagues. And I said, but that's, that's, that's not the way you are supposed to say. Can you imagine first, morally, what does it mean that you earn the money of citizens who pay Interest rates on interest rates, you know, in which country you would be allowed to, to do that? 
And the country, uh, we decide cases uh, uh, daily and there by numbers. And I was barely remembering the case, and then I gathered colleagues. I said, look, we have to write the decision and finish because this, this is what happened. And this case should be closed uh, uh, as soon as possible because this can have public. Uh, and it was, of course, uh, closed the way Constitution and lo the law says. As I said, in no country uh, in, in the Western world you would be allowed to, 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 to pay, to pay uh, uh, that type of uh, interest rates. And that had, would have systemic, and it had systemic uh, consequences because there were thousands of citizens who were in delay and then who could not, for example, whose houses or whatever would have been confiscated and the like. So this is, I would say, these, these are two among, among others that I feel, I, uh, I feel proud. In fact, I feel proud for all my mandate because uh, that, were, that were formative years of the institution which uh, I had that privilege and that uh, destiny to be uh, to be part of that team. So, so I I, uh, I asked also about a, a controversial case, but I'll, I I will first read something that you've written, and uh, and then I will ask you to respond to that, please. So, in a paper you write, constitutional courts have immensely impacted the work of legislators. Kosovo is no excep exception in this regard. This is, in fact, the oldest aspect of constitutional justice and is generally known as negative legislator role of constitutional courts. Most of the time, constitutional courts remain within the confine of this classical duty. History shows, however, that out of necessity and as a matter of pragmatic policy, constitutional courts may overstep their competences, acting not only as positive legislators, but also as creative policymakers involved in the governance of society. Have you acted in that way? Well, uh, as I said, the, uh, that term, negative legislation, was coined by Hans Kelsen. For those who are lawyers, know it. It's called Chicago School. Uh, Hans Kelsen was with uh, Hans Morgenthau, another famous scholar in international relations, uh, who fled the Nazi persecution and then uh, established what is known, as I said, the Chicago School. And he's published that uh, in the 20s because he, he is the founder of the Austrian Constitutional Court, first Constitutional Court ever. He said when he was criticized by his colleagues back then that, look, Constitutional Court means to, be, to legislate the way, what are you saying? Well, he said, yes, in a sense, once you invalidate the law as a court, you negatively legislate because you say no. But over the time, courts became positive legislators because, as I said, German, for example, Italian, some Latin American constitutional courts have, Czech court is as well known for this, they order legislators the text of the law, how it should be, let alone that they invalidate certain parts of it. But they say, for example, Italians say, sentenza additivo, uh, uh, that this law can be constitutional if you read the way as we do, that is, and they put commas, inverted commas, and then they say how the law should, should be. And this is one of the critics for, with the Supreme Court of the United States as well. For example, if you would see your constitution and what is a cons American constitution, then I, I would uh, believe that founding fathers and those who drafted the Constitution, they would uh, be amazed to see, for example, issue of white taping or you know, uh, uh, issue of abortion or million issues of daily life. That's why, by default, courts not create law, not only interpret law, but we do, uh, in certain circumstances, we. Uh, created. And we have done that because, for example, our constitution, when we ruled in one case, president, president's case, doesn't foresee, strange enough as it may sound, you know, resignation of the president, of the head of state, okay? Can he now say that, well, since this is not foreseen in your constitution, then he can or she can never uh, resign? Of course not, because resignation is, is 
uh, uh, legal category that is as old as humanity, if, of course, with different uh, formats and, and forms of manifestation. And then, or for example, acting president uh, beyond serving for six months, what if the time lapses, which constitution is silent on that? And many, many other issues we ruled over uh, uh, have uh, offered us that stuff, that, uh, you know, that label. And it's not only us. For example, in uh, some uh, constitutional courts of Europe, you know, uh, uh, that charge was even, you know, uh, Yeltsin, for example, in uh, 98 closed, shut down the constitutional court. <laughs> you know, because of one of the rules which was not to, 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 to his favor. So, and in this sense, uh, it's uh, the more political culture is very important, the way, the way uh, regarding how decisions uh, are implemented, constitutional court decisions. But, uh, but I want to ask you a question, and just for context, so in, uh, I guess back in 2010, uh, President uh, of Kosovo resigned, and then in early 2011, I might be getting a, a bit dates wrong, but in 2011, um, a, a president was elected in Kosovo, the president is elected by the parliament, uh, which has 120 members. Um, and then there was a ruling uh, by the constitutional court led by Dr. Hassani that invalidated that election essentially. Uh, and so there was a new president that was elected and she finished her term, she was here <laughs> last week. Um, and there were elections, uh, general elections, uh, a, a few years later, uh, and there was an attempt by political parties to create a majority by bypassing the party that had won the relative majority. Um, and then you ruled again. Uh, and, and so uh, in Kosovo, Dr. Hassani was seen as this larger-than-life uh, figure who was able to do whatever he wanted. <laughs> but no. of course, I wanted to know, yeah. I want to know, what was your, uh, how did you approach your, your duty uh, in that case? Right. Because, uh, y as you mentioned, you know that whatever you're going to rule, you're going to please right. and displease some. Well, uh, as you know, once you are Chief Justice, you lead a judicial institution, you are not supposed to speak in media. Then I had to be silent because, and people would perceive that as if it was me, nine. There were nine judges, you know. I was one of them, for example, deciding alongside with them. As I said, three were internationals and uh, uh, two were non-Albanians. Co uh, Kosovar communities, but non-Albanian Kosovar communities. Then, uh, most of the time, I used to speak English, for example, uh, uh, and we had the very, uh, the court still, it was uh, financed by American uh, USAID. A very sophisticated uh, IT system, which is which still is air based, uh, air based. Everything was taped, and I would speak out of respect for international colleagues, mo most ninety percent in English, or out of respect for our uh, uh, communities, Kosovo communities in Serbian, uh, sometimes jokingly in Turkish. <laughs> uh, the then. As I said, the basic reason why that controversy, of course, it's political stakes. Some decisions that have political ramifications are usually, you know, raise a public debate, which is legitimate. It's not legitimate to contest decisions as they did. But discussing, and it's very healthy, if, uh, especially if, uh, if academic is led by academic world. Uh, our constitution is still in force, the same provision, the same article says that uh, following the elections, following the elections, the government is formed by the party who wins majority. You know, it doesn't say majority seats in the parliament, that's for formation, that's a different story. But there should be someone who leads the formation of the government. That is the party or coalition that is entitled to, still today, to approach head of state, because that's European system, to say this is our candidate 
for Prime Minister, for Chief Executive, Head of the Executive Staff. If it fails, then it's 15 days afterwards, and then if then again fails, it's for its extra its elections, extraordinary elections within 40 days. So, what happened is this: 24 hours following the publication of the election results. For it was formed a majority that lost in the elections. And always those who lose, who lose it are in majority. <laughs> That's, it's, it's as simple as that. And then they said, we are the winners because we are now majority of the party who, because our system is that, that no party can uh, win 50% plus one and form alone. It always needs to have a coalition. It's a proportional system for 100 uh, votes. 20% is not counted in this because it's for communities of Kosovo. Then the party that had won elections wanted to lead standard procedure, form a coalition with one or two others, and then <coughs> present. <coughs> and then it needed absolute majority, 50 plus one to <clears throat> to form the government. And this was the first time heard in our yeah. uh, practice, yeah. and it took us several months. And then it was on, in media, this what I say, it's done in media. And then the whole, since I was not entitled, I was not supposed to, to argue with people in public, because as president of the course, you cannot argue for something which you are not decision maker. Then the whole, <coughs> The whole stuff went against me. First, it started, which is very common in the Balkans, <coughs> to threaten through an anonymous phone calls, threatening me, my family, kids. <coughs> if you don't rule this way or that way, you know. Then they started all sorts of dirty stuff. In fact, I said once in media, I was terrorized, me and my family. <coughs> and then I was, of course, reporting every time with my colleagues. Because that decision took uh, several weeks, months, to, to decide, because there are procedures. You have to send parties what you think, what the other thing. Once you receive answers, you send the answers to the other party. You collect the evidentiary material, and then you, once final is uh, all administration of evidence, and then when we decided then, it was like, you know, we were majority this and that. After I left the office, Two more governments, three more governments, in fact, were formed based on the same, from the very same people who were terrorizing me and my family. The same people <laughs> became prime ministers with the same decision. And the current prime minister is based on that decision as well. So, so uh, yeah, so, so this is, of course, uh, a very exciting uh, Who were in opposition. Yes. <laughs> Um, and, and it's it's it's. Uh, thank you so much for you know for for giving us uh, all these details. And uh, I would like now to turn our focus a little bit on on what are the current major obstacles in in Kosovo's democracy. And uh, if you could please tell us about the internal challenges and obstacles, <coughs> and also discuss how the regional uh, situation. Of course, added to this, the, the, the Russian aggression against Ukraine contributes to these challenges. Look, uh, uh, and, and, then, and then I will right, have one more good, question, so if you could... Right, sure. The uh, issue of good governance uh, in Kosovo, uh, as elsewhere in the region, is learning process. You know, uh, every year it goes, we are better than better. The biggest problem that we face is, of course, uh, like the majority of the European uh, neighboring countries, is corruption and nepotism. Clan-based politics, you know, which is, it takes time to get uprooted. It takes time 
and uh, our structure, state structures are not, uh, are not, uh, not capable of, in, when I say state structures, I mean first and foremost uh, prosecution, judiciary, but as well uh, other law enforcement agencies are not up to the duty because uh, it's general environment. Our borders are very porous, you know, for the organized crime, drug trafficking, prostitution, money laundering above all, the construction industry, which is, you know, a paradise for, you know, uh, for, for, for that uh, matter. Second uh, uh, issue is that is affecting and drying out our energies is dialogue with Serbia, with our, you know, we seceded from Serbia. We are the only country uh, that emerged from former Yugoslavia out of secession. Other, when Yugoslavia dissolved, the, all were republics, federal republics, and that they had the right to self, full self-determination. Uh, 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 we, uh, our was very specific and tragic I would say on par with Bosnia, Herzegovina, and as I said, with uh, uh, American, first and foremost, American wholehearted uh, help and European, our European friends, we managed to liberate and to get where we are, of course, with our uh, armed resistance, which was uh, led by uh, Kosovo Liberation Army, uh, which was then clandestine army, guerrilla fight, which took place two years among those killed almost uh, 12,000 was my mother was killed at the doorstep as well by uh, Milosevic's uh, regime. Then uh, we have unsettled issues because our statehood was contested by Serbia. Serbia still insists that the Kosovo, as strange as it may sound for you, they say is our Jerusalem. They see it as a holy cradle of their national identity, which they cannot, you know. It's pure myth, but as we say in uh, sociological theory, myth, myth reality. They, people can kill you as the Serbs under Milosevic killed others on behalf and in the name of that myth to revenge Kosovo. They fought in Croatia, in Bosnia, saying that we are avenging the Holy Land of Kosovo while we were under repression. And then they turned us against us uh, uh, lastly. But they believe it. They believe that this, this. They sent the issue to the International Court of Justice in 2010. And the International Court of Justice, because those who are lawyers, they know they can reframe the question. But the question of the Serbs was this. Does Kosovo have the right to self-determination, meaning secession, more or less to simplify things? And the court said, that question has an answer in itself. It's prejudicial, uh, prejudicial. So that's why we have to reframe the question, and they did. Whether the declaration of independence of Kosovo violated international law. And the court found no. The court said, declarations of independence per se during the 18th and 19th and 20th century did not violate constitutional law. Whether a state is created or not is a matter of fact. There is a different issue which the co this court, as it says, this court cannot answer. Then the question was posed by Serbia through the General Assembly of the United Nations. Then uh, court gave the answer to the General Assembly and the General Assembly said a resolution that the parties, something like this, have to, to settle pending issues among themselves through dialogue, and, because that's the only way to move ahead in the Balkans, and everywhere, in fact, especially in the Balkans, following all those tragic events. Uh, this was in, this was in, in September two, 2010? 2010, July. Yes. And then the, the, the resolution was passed, as you say, in September 2010, and then, uh, now we are in a dialogue. Everything in Kosovo, unfortunately, is defined uh, through the lenses of dialogue with Serbia. Most of energy 
is dried by efforts of all leaders, position and opposition, to try to find some way out so that this issue is, is uh, closed with Serbia, one way or the other? Is, is, the, is, the, is the, uh, the, the current war in Ukraine, has that had a direct impact it does, on the uh, Kosovo Serbia? Sure, battle? sure. Then, uh, and what, what is uh, before that the war in Ukraine, before the war in Ukraine, the dialogue would go back and forth, you know, Serbs agreed for some concessions to come to the Kosovo legal constitutional system to be judges and police and all of that. They were kind of integrated. When the war in Ukraine happened, in fact, uh, aggression and tragedy, because that's, uh, that's bar uh, barbarian stuff what is going there and we who suffered under uh, dictatorships, because Putin is not any different from Milosevic, no, feel it had the general repercussions, global repercussions. Some of them extended to the Kosovo-Albania relationship. A perception in Kosovo of our leaders, current leaders, was utterly wrong uh, because they believed that uh, fighting in Ukraine would prove our just cause. Look, Serbia, because Russian sentiment in Serbia among population is very high. And, and it's not s secret because that's something which, uh, which is known. It's not something that you have to prove. It's obvious. I mean, election polls show it. And once the war started there, Serbian nas pro-Russian nationalism emerged or resurfaced all the lies, historical ties, and all those brotherhood stuff, Slavic stuff that you hear. In fact, that's 19th century stuff, but still is re-emerged not only now, as you know, in Yugoslav wars as well. Then uh, the calculation, which was utterly wrong, was that, um, and the pressure of the West was to cut Serbia from, because Serbia is the only country in the Balkans that has close ties with Russia, used to have, in fact, close ties to Russia, and China. All other countries, they, or it is surrounded by NATO countries. Serbia is surrounded by NATO countries, including Kosovo, because not NATO country, but we have NATO presence, uh, military presence in, in uh, our country. So uh, all that effort, then Serbia started to make use of it. Until then, including President Biden and the whole world would say, the only solution, which is true, the only solution is mutual recognition. Without mutual recognition, no peace, no, can, no stabilization uh, can happen. Of course, Serbia, its, it's uh, pro-Western stance conditions, condition with Kosovo, saying, look, this was in public. If you start pressuring me with Kosovo to recognize Kosovo, then I cannot, because I cannot, Pro-Russian sentiment will kill me all over. This was which is, and it's still. Which is the Serbian view, president. President, yeah. Serbian, uh, president uh, of Serbia. And then, European, uh, European friends, French and French and German, they had uh, understanding for this grievance of Serbia, and they drafted a plan, which was signed, not signed, but basically that's done deal, two days ago in which there is no, of course, recognition, neither de facto nor de jure uh, uh, of Kosovo, and in which Kosovo agreed to give immense concessions to, uh, to Serbia, to uh, President Vucic, in exchange for certain stability. Because uh, there was a general perception that uh, Putin has been very skillful in fighting hybrid, hybrid wars, as you know, not only in the Balkans and elsewhere, wherever, uh, wherever Western interest would uh, uh, um, be present, then Putin would do his best to, to interfere with it through different means of hybrid, as you, you, you all know, 
uh, policies and practices. Which he did. So and this is, here we are now at the stage, I would say, um, in a sense, because legally I don't see how, as I said, we are consociational democracy. How can that uh, uh, agreement and its implementing legislation, which will have thousands, uh, hundreds of articles, I'm sure, it will have implementing legislation, which is as thick as the Constitution of Kosovo, how it will fit within our democracy, because until now, in a sense, in certain places, Kosovo, in, a, in basic provisions of our constitution, was defined, would mention uh, ethnic communities, Albanians, Serbs, and others. Now, with this, what happened would be the opposite. It's like Kosovo is tending to be democracy uh, of the Serbs and the others other communities, because now uh, they have, in a sense, received special uh, status with our, our legal order, and how it will be implemented, it remains to be seen, how successful it will be, but for sure, I am sure that Vucic will uh, continue blackmailing our friends with new concessions as the time goes on. This doesn't fit, this doesn't fit, this is not okay, this is the and the like. So now we will see how, but uh, Ukraine aggression against Ukraine is, this was the way how it was translated into Kosovo-Serbia dialogue. Thank Which you. It's opposite of expectations of majority Kosovo population and its leadership. Uh, so that's, that's a, an interesting uh, and, and uh, explanation of uh, what's going on. And, and of course, this is a very, you know, current topic in, in the region. Um, as Dr. Hassani mentioned, talks took place two days ago in Brussels, and uh, they will continue in a few weeks' time with the, uh, uh, with the, what is called the EU facilitation and with the support of the United States. So uh, it remains to be seen how, how things will go on. Um, I would like to open now the floor to uh, questions uh, from the audience. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question and we will have one brief answer. <laughs> the Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. So please phrase your questions with this in mind and ask just one brief question. So I will start here. Uh, good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, so you talked a lot about this idea of legislating this this positive or negative legislation um, from the Constitutional Court. And we see a lot of that with the Supreme Court of the United States as well. Um, there is this balance that needs to be struck between judicial constraint versus offering legislation, essentially, um, which leads to a lot of tension and, and questions of legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Um, whereas a lot of folks are to the point where they don't necessarily trust the Supreme Court at this point. I'm curious, do you see that um, happening in Kosovo with the Constitutional Court, or is there something else that is that factor with the Kosovo Constitutional Court? Right. Thank, you. Thank you for the question. It's right to the point uh, and highly munitious. Uh, uh, I, I was. I will tell you, in my time, opposition was a, a, a block against, they said, constitutional government, in fact, they were identified wrongly with me. And they were all rallying against uh, me. As I said, the same people, a year after I finished my mandate, elections, they started interpreting with my words the, uh, the constitution. So, the biggest challenge for constitutional justice is legitimacy. As uh, Mark, who said, one of your authors, I don't want to, because I don't remember exactly, nine monarchs. You know, in a sense, it's the same 
challenge. Legitimacy is for highest judicial instances everywhere problematic. How come that nine people or 12 people, depending on the model, are deciding existential issues such as death penalty, same-sex marriage? For example, in Kosovo, I'm sure, uh, in many Soviet Union, in many uh, uh, former communist countries of Europe, death penalty was abolished sorry, by, uh, by constitutional courts, not by legislators, because they lose votes, okay? Same-sex marriage is the same story. Is that only, they tend to say, well, conservative societies for LGBT community would uh, tend, uh, is this is American or whatever, European, but it's not. It's not, it's, it's religious education of all creeds, not only Abrahamic religions, every. So and it's, it's highly difficult for those who run for vote to settle that issue which is basic human rights, right to dignity. Then it's nine monarchs who will have to settle at the end of the day, as they, as they did in some uh, European society. And they will, I, I expect that Kosovo one day soon might, might face the same story. Now, after I left, the, the very same people who were against, they gradually saw that they were wrong, and the court was... Uh, Smoothly, you know, uh, now more or less, it's like elsewhere. You know, for example, I will tell you one life uh, experience, which is right to the point. Supreme Court in Kosovo is different than it does just case and controversy, not constitutional issues, like in uh, Supreme Court of, st of, of member states of United States. They went to Germany, which is the most powerful constitutional court in Europe and the most intellectually uh, capable uh, constitutional court. We quashed several decisions of the Supreme Court and uh, colleagues from that court went for a visit in Germany and telling president of the Supreme Court, well, tell us how, how is your relationship with the uh, constitutional court of Germany? Do they, uh, do they crush your decision? Do they invalidate your decision? Oh, yeah, of course, that's very common. Ever since, you know, it started to, because until then they were very sour and then we discussed, we had common seminars, conferences, and it's still general trend in, in, in Kosovo, uh, dialogue, intercourt dialogue, which is extremely, extremely, now it's stabilized. But as I said, political and legal culture was very, uh, those days was very something new. That's why I paid the price, me, myself, more than my colleagues who were with me in that uh, formation, first generation of uh, judges. Uh, and uh, now everyone, everybody understands and it's, you know. But some decisions are not enforced. Some, very few, yeah. which is wrong. It's so, utterly wrong. So that, that's why we have you here in Kansas, and we're happy to have you here. I, I think there was another question from the gentleman over there. Yeah, good evening. Thank you for uh, being here. Um, so the idea of um, wondering in Kosovo today, uh, the concept of uh, reparations for past injustices, um, how is that um, seen by people in Kosovo, you know, with regard to, say, the Milosevic regime, right. or, um, you know, we've had, here in the United States, we've had situations where the idea of reparations for past injustices right. has come up, you know, numerous times, and, you know, sometimes politicians say they want to do something about it, but uh, not very much gets done, uh, oftentimes. So um, yeah, if you could speak to um, whether you see that, um, you know, how, how uh, might that happen or, or where, that, where is that going currently? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. That's, uh, that's a topic that emerges on and off in Kosovo in our general public discourse. There are two, two concepts of reparations within, within Yugoslav, former Yugoslav context. One is war reparations, and there is a decision of a 
which was led by a French Bad Inter Commission, we say, and which was later sanctioned by legal international bodies, we said, within the Yugoslav context, there can be no reparation for war damages because the war and atrocities happened in a specific way as a part of the dissolution of the general state because the state of Yugoslavia was dissolved entirely. That's why, because war reparations have a presupposition, a guilt, meaning that there should be a decision of a body, international body like with Nazi Germany, for example, that says you are guilty party as a state for commencing the war. Therefore, you are bound to pay, that's basic stuff about reparation. Reparations in the uh, way you frame for past injustices can be, because there is immense practice, and uh, uh, Zelensky said for Ukraine, for example, to freeze assets, Russian assets, which may happen to compensate people, for example, for, for the injustice done uh, during the uh, aggression or the issue of uh, September 11 uh, tragic events, uh, uh, which was raised as an issue. Uh, we, we don't have Serbian assets that can, we can freeze to compensate for that because in addition to war damages, rape, massive rape of women and uh, 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 others, uh, we, we have a, a pension fund of Kosovo which was confiscated by Serbia. It was millions of dollars of that time. Issue of succession of former Yugoslavia is closed in 2001, which includes, and then all, but we were then excluded by that process because we were not sovereign state then. So we are the only ones who, with whom that issue was never discussed, neither in classical form nor in the form of reparations for injustice. That can happen theoretically only. For me, it's difficult to, to figure out how can that, unless, of course, your uh, great country who has been with us helps us to put pressure on Serbia to do that by freezing some assets of Serbia, which is just pure theory. This is up, maybe bordered with fantasy, but uh, I'm sharing this with you. And it's difficult to, and, and it, can, part of a general, it can be part of a general dialogue. Once, hopefully one day, one generation will close with Serbia in one way or the other, then that can be part of, uh, you know, uh, redressing that uh, grievance, which is immense material and moral damage done to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Kosovo citizens of Albanian, ethnic Albanian mm, uh, origin. What you see now in Ukraine, just in a smaller scale, because we are 11,000 square around square kilometers, but all that you see atrocities in Ukraine committed against Ukrainians have happened in, in, in Kosovo during those two years of fight. Yes, uh, so I, I see another question. Uh, Yes, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, court legitimacy and corruption uh, in the Balkans and in Kosovo. What does public trust in the court system uh, and the constitutional court look like in comparison to like public trust or relationships with other agencies or institutions? I, I would say uh, one thing. Constitutional court, both during my mandate and now, has been the, in a, the, the highest as far as that uh, goes. No ever, no, no one has ever raised the, they were attacking me for, as I said, terrorizing me and my family, but no one would ever think of corruption or something like that. Uh, for the, they, they said that the decisions are biased because as I said, it's constitutional interpretation. People, you cannot satisfy all people, but not because that was, is different story with regular judicial and public prosecution office. In fact, corruption is more associated with public prosecution office than with regular judiciary. Regular judi why? And, and the police. Why? Because 
through lawyers who mediate this stuff with police officers and pub, pub, public prosecution offices. They close and open the cases in the early stage. When it goes to the court, it remains little for corruption for those. For those days. So it's less expressed in the court system, more is uh, with, within police and, and uh, public prosecution's um, office. And this is, as I said, look, vetting process in Albania went from scratch. It's going on for six years. And in fact, it's difficult to see the end of it. They managed to neutralize substantially corruption stuff. But it, but our, that was done by internationals. Our international friends see it as a nightmare to do the same vetting six or 10 years, how much money is spent there. Then half of the judges were fired and prosecution. Backlog has risen in thousands, which can take maybe half a century to, to solve those questions, those cases. So no one, no one anymore, everybody wants to discipline judiciary within the le current legal system through public pressure, watchdogs, dogs, and the like. So uh, uh, that, that's the only, in fact, uh, 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 the only path that I see as uh, reasonable uh, 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 for the time being. Then is military. Our military has good name uh, in, in that regard as well as far as corruption. No one mentions them. So these are the two institutions then, of course, when I say police is just exception, it's not, it's, is not expressed corruption in police the way it is, for example, in other, in uh, other bodies, and of course in, in politicians, some of the politicians. Great. So I think we have time for one last question. If there's a, a question, was there someone? So um, I, I think that's 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 good. Um, in this case, um, please allow me to uh, thank uh, Dr. Hassani on your behalf for this very exciting conversation. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for, for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, since it's the, uh, the end of my series, I would like to thank uh, the Dole Institute, uh, all the people at Dole Institute, it's been a wonderful uh, occasion for me to discover this exciting place, and uh, it's been really a pleasure to spend time in Kansas. And I welcome, I hope to welcome you to uh, Kosovo. Don't forget, you've got a small country. Uh, Dr. Hassani mentioned uh, the size in kilometers. Uh, you, you know, it's better to say it in miles, 40,000 square miles. Uh, so it's a small country, uh, but that welcomes you with a big heart. So thank you again, and uh, see you next time. Thank you.